Good morning, North America. Good afternoon, Europe, and good evening to everyone watching us from India. This is U.S. Election Watch. I'm Alistair D'Souza in Washington, D.C. The headlines: Six days to go, and Harris leads in a narrow margin in the national polls. Harris and Trump are tied in battleground Pennsylvania. The U.S. economy remains strong. 2.8 percent growth reported in the third quarter. The data comes as the economy remains the top election issue. The U.S. Supreme Court allows Virginia to remove 1,600 voters. The purge is to remove purported non-citizens from voter rolls. Now, six days remain in what's looking like the closest race in U.S. election history, and yes, the polls show the same story as Kamala Harris's slim lead appears to dwindle. The latest Reuters Ipsos poll shows that both Harris and Trump essentially are neck and neck in the national polls, with the vice president maintaining a narrow single-point lead. Meanwhile, the swing state in focus for the two camps today is Wisconsin. Harris is holding a rally at the U. University of Wisconsin. Former President Donald Trump will speak at a campaign rally in Green Bay, and that's in Wisconsin as well. He will also later be in North Carolina. Now, as Kamala Harris sets off on a final sprint through the key battleground states, she held a massive rally in Washington D.C. on Tuesday evening. Now, some estimates put the crowd gathered at 75,000. Harris's pick of that venue was to make a statement. Her closing argument speech took place in an area near the White House where Donald Trump held his rally on January 6. 2021. Now, remember, hours later, thousands of his supporters stormed the Capitol and disrupted the certification of Joe Biden's presidential victory. Let's listen in to what Harris had to say in her speech on Tuesday night. America, we know what Donald Trump has in mind: more chaos, more division, and policies that help those at the very top. And hurt everyone else. I offer a different path, and I ask for your vote. And here is my pledge to you: I pledge to seek common ground and common sense solutions to make your life better. I am not looking to score political points. Now, Indian Americans have long leaned Democrat and still continue to do, but that bond is not as strong as it used to be, with many more leaning Republican in election 2024. Now, that's according to a recent poll by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Here's a closer look at the Indian American vote and why it matters in deciding who wins the White House. The United States is often called a nation of immigrants because it has the largest immigrant population in the world. Out of all immigrant groups in the country, Indian Americans are now the second largest, making them an important part of the presidential election process. The community has mostly favored the Democratic Party, according to a survey released by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in New Gov. 61% of registered Indian American voters plan to vote for Kamala Harris, and 31% intend to cast a ballot for Trump. Indian Americans have emerged as an important political actor thanks to the community's rapid demographic growth, the close margins in modern presidential elections, and the diaspora's remarkable professional success, according to the survey. So how can Indian Americans impact the U.S. elections? Out of the more than five million Indian Americans present in the country, over 2.5 million are eligible to vote. It is the most politically active group among Asian Americans. To put it into perspective, 
Joe Biden defeated Trump by a margin of just over 12,000 votes in Georgia in 2020, making each vote valuable. Though Indian diaspora comprises a small share of overall electorate, both the parties have actively wooed Indian American voters. In a campaign advertisement, Harris explicitly invoked her mother as a brilliant brown woman with an accent. The Republican campaign has also turned the spotlight on the community due to the Indian roots of Usha Vance, the wife of Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance. Indian Americans have been thrust into the limelight owing to the possibility that for the first time in the U.S.'s history, a candidate of Indian heritage could have the top job in the nation. The latest poll also shows a modest drift towards Trump and Republicans. The poll says the drift is driven by Indian American men, particularly younger men born in the U.S. A survey done earlier has said that the number of Indians who identify as Democrats slipped from 54% in 2020 to 47%. In the same time frame, those who identify as Republicans rose from 16% to 21%, further solidifying the notion that both parties look at this community with hope. Vishal Vivek for NDTV World. Let's uh, dwell deeper into that conversation about Indian Americans. We are joined by Ajay Bhattoria. He is the Deputy National Finance Chair with the Democratic Party. Also with us is Rick Mehta, former Republican nominee for U.S. Senate in New Jersey. Let's come to you first now, Ajay. According to that Carnegie Endowment Survey, 6 in 10 Indian Americans regist registered voters intend to vote for Harris. However, a greater share of respondents now willing to vote for Trump since the last election, especially amongst Indian American men. Why do you think that's the case? What's moved? Uh, let's look at the other way that 61% or more are, or 70% are voting for Kamala Harris and uh, they're excited about uh, Harris candidacy. And there's a small percentage of uh, who are voting for Trump. But, uh, you know, uh, Harris, uh, as you said in your play that she, her mother was from India and uh, the the enthusiasm in the battleground states is very high. Uh, Indian Americans are looking forward to elect someone who can they relate to who has origin from India. And, and on the matters of issues, uh, when uh, Trump was the president, uh, he basically, uh, you know, uh, for the for the immigration here, uh, he had uh, uh, issues with H one four EADs where he made it difficult for folks to get H one and and and, and em employment authorization card okay. and so many other issues. Yeah. So looking at, I mean, Kamala Harris on the other hand uh, has a personal Ajay, uh, connection Rick with our brother. Ajay there focusing on the glass being half full rather than half empty. What are your thoughts about this growing shift, although slightly modest people would say, towards Trump from Indian Americans? What I would say is that uh, Indian Americans are focused, have always been historically focused on two things. We've come to this country as a land of opportunity, and so our nature is to be uh, opportunistic. And so looking at sort of a dichotomy of the issues, we look at the social issues, whether or not our uh, heritage, our culture, and others will be protected from uh, racism and xenophobia um, versus the economy. And I think what we've seen is a significant shift where the Biden-Harris uh, administration has been unable to manage the administration. Um, and as Indian Americans, we know that how it very effectively uh, to handle our money. And if we see an administration that doesn't know how to handle money the same way we do, uh, then we begin to worry about that. And so I think the shift towards Trump is that we're looking at someone uh, who knows how to manage the economy, who can, uh, again, as Trump says, make America great again. What does that mean? Economic power um, and affordability, bring down interest rates, bring down inflation and make it affordable okay. across the board. We've also seen the end of affirmative action, which has unfairly discriminated against the Indian American community, which Trump supports. And I think that's really important to the future generation of Indian Americans and our students. And 
and we see uh, the significant involvement in government in in our family lives and in our schools. And as proud Indian Americans, we care about our family, we care about our schools, and we care about our economy. All right, we're also joined by Robert Shapiro. He's a political science professor at Columbia University. Welcome, Robert. Now, Robert, you've been listening in here. Now, one of the things that the survey also did was to ask respondents who they would support if November's presidential election was between two Indian origin candidates, hypothetically speaking, Nikki Haley on one side and Kamala Harris on the other. Now, 61% favored Harris, while only 20% favored Haley. What does that tell us about race? Race not being as important for Indian Americans as compared to what the party may stand for. What would your take be? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree with you on and it was just pointed pointed out um, in the Indian Indian Americans in, in terms of the things that they would tend to vote on are the same as other Americans, other minority groups and uh, the public as a whole. The thing that's that's been hurting um, Harris, and, and we see this in decline in support for Harris compared to Biden in, in the last election, is the, the performance of the, of the perceived performance of the of the, the Biden administration. But the big party divide here, and this is something you haven't mentioned, the Carnegie survey reported that, that Indian Americans tend to lean to the left. And it looks like they lean to the left as much as or more than any other group in the United States. And that's, pre- that's pretty striking. And that may reflect the greater support for uh, Democrats rather than Republicans. And you would, you would see this by the head-on comparison between Nikki Haley and, and Kamala Harris. But we're also hearing from that survey, Robert, some of which we asked our guests, uh, Rick and Ajay, about is the fact that that kind of lead or that love with uh, towards Harris is somewhat weakening now, modestly. So where Trump is seen, seen to be more in favor. So why do you think that's the case? Um, I, I, I tend to disagree oh, with I, that. I, I, I think... Uh, I think I, uh, that's for Robert. Please, Robert, go ahead. Oh no, I, I, I think I think what that's reflecting is that the election is really coming coming down to, an, an, a, for many voters, the assess their their assessment of the Biden the Biden Harris administration, and that re, and that reflects the, the the weakening of the support for well for Biden compared to 2020, and by by inference here also Harris compared to Biden to Biden in 2020. All right. Uh, just one quick question uh, before we go here for Ajay. Uh, very quickly here, let's look at how some of those uh, people responded as far as the birthplace go. Now, amongst American Indian respondents born abroad, let's say India, both men and women, show high support for Harris. But the pattern really shifts when looking at U.S. Born respondents, U.S. born women favor Harris hugely, but U.S. born men sharply support Trump. So, why do you think that's happening? So uh, Kamala Harris, on, uh, as I said earlier, has a personal connection to our community. As a daughter of Indian Im- immigrant mother, her story reflects the struggles and aspiration of countless South Asians who have come to America and seek a better life. And uh, and that uh, narrative, uh, Harris has often shared... Yeah, but why are young men not really supporting her anymore as much as they used to? Especially um, ones born in the uh, US. I, you know, there are... Yeah, there are so many polls out there, but on the ground situation, when we knock doors in Philadelphia, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in, in Georgia, there's a, such a huge, a huge enthusiasm. And that enthusiasm can be seen at multi-level that we have thousands of Indian American volunteers of all ages from, uh, you know, 60 plus to uh, 30 plus to 20 uh, young voters from, uh, 60, uh, you know, 18 to, to age, uh, 18 to 30. Okay. They're all volunteering and making doors and making phones and calls. So what we are Seeing in the ground reality is there's a huge enthusiasm for uh, Kamala Harris, and I'll uh, I will add you on the economy. Right. We had one of the best economies okay. uh, where the I- stock market. Uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, they're the highest on the immigration issues. Kamala Harris and by the way, so much for H one visa stamping. Just one more minute. 
H1 visa stamping in US, which I'm Okay, so Ajay, we've got to leave it there, running out of time here. Ajay, choosing to see this uh, on the brighter side of things. Ajay, thank you very much for your time. Rick as well. Robert, you're going to stay on. We have some more questions. Get your neutral opinion on some other issues as well coming up later in the show. So do stay with us. Now, moving on to other news with just six days until Election Day, officials are on high alert after ballot drop boxes were set on fire in Washington and Oregon. This concerns early mail-in ballots that are put into drop boxes around neighborhoods. Now in Portland and Vancouver, two drop boxes were torched. Most ballots in Portland were recovered, but hundreds were lost in Vancouver, where nearly 500 damaged ballots were later found. Now authorities are optimistic that they can identify most affected voters, but some believe other ballots may have been completely destroyed. Now joining me for more is Janet Keeney. She is from Vancouver in Washington state. She is one of the hundreds of people who found out that her ballot had been destroyed. Thanks, Janet, for your time this morning. Janet, what was your reaction when you heard this? And also, how did you hear about it, that your mail-in ballot was destroyed? Well, my reaction was shock and dismay. Um, But what happened was I was driving Monday morning listening to my public radio um, and heard about the ballots being, uh, the boxes being set on fire and when they talked about which location it was realized that that was where my husband and I had dropped our ballots off on Saturday evening so immediately uh tried to rectify that by calling the elections office which were the instructions that were given and um got the ballot have gone in and got new ballots but I was very upset dismayed trying to do the right thing (laughs) by um getting voting early and just very upset by that Okay, Janet, what happens now? What are officials telling you? What are you going to do? Well, I've gone into the uh, election office yesterday. I got a new ballot. I picked up a new ballot for my husband. I voted there and then, brought my other ballot home for my husband to fill out, and he will mail that in or we will drop it off at the elections office. So things have been rectified. There were many people at the elections office within similar situations where their ballots had been destroyed. So it was good to see there was an outpouring of people trying to rectify the situation. Right. Thanks very much indeed. Janet Keeney there joining us from Vancouver in Washington state. She found out that her ballot had been destroyed, burnt actually in a ballot box that was uh, set aflame. Now, the White House seems to be in damage control mode after U.S. President, after U.S. President Biden in a in a moment defending the Puerto Rican community, seemingly called Trump supporters garbage. Now, while the White House quickly stepped in to clarify Biden's comments, arguing that he was describing the racist language as garbage, not Trump supporters. Now, Republicans have widely criticized the remarks, seizing the gaffe, comparing it to comments by Hillary Clinton in 2016, when she referred to Trump supporters as deplorables. Now, Biden's comments come in response to Trump's closing argument rally in New York over the weekend. One of the speakers at that rally referred to Puerto Rico as a floating island of garbage. Meanwhile, Republican nominee Trump has claimed that voter fraud is happening in two Pennsylvania counties, even though officials are still investigating voter registration issues there. With just a week until Election Day, Trump and the Republican National Committee seem to be preparing to challenge the results if he loses Trump raised concerns on social media about fraudulent registrations before waiting for the investigations in certain counties there in Pennsylvania, despite Pennsylvanian authorities, the Secretary of State, for example, saying and asking for patience and that the matter is being investigated. Meanwhile, the latest CBS News poll reveals that both Trump and Harris are tied in the crucial swing state of Pennsylvania, We are now joined by Robert Shapiro, who you saw earlier. Thanks, uh, Robert, for staying on. He's a professor of political science at Columbia University. Robert, Trump and other Republican officials are increasingly floating these claims about potential issues with mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania. State officials, as we said, reassuring voters of the integrity of the ballot process. How worried are you? And give us really 
an understanding of the gravity of the situation that Trump really wants us to believe is huge. Yeah, well, what, what Trump seems to be doing is setting the stage for his declaring the, that the election is fraudulent if he loses. Um, it, it, it's, it's pretty clear that this has been his, his strategy all along. And what you, what you see, his claims right now in Pennsylvania, uh, doing pre precisely that. And the, 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 the fact that we've seen, you know, fire set at ballot boxes, that, re that, re that really, you know, re reinforces the possibility here of complaints about the use of ballot box boxes and, and, and any other changes that have been made in election procedures that, that Trump and his supporters think is you know, working to his disadvantage. But on the whole, how concerned are you about the integrity of the election process? Because there are several people who actually believe what Trump says as far as the whole election likely going to be skewed, especially, of course, paving that way, as you said, if he loses. Well, with regard to the integrity of, of the counting of the votes and the, the determining the outcome of the elections, we saw in, we saw in 2020 any claims of, of fraud were, ba were basically found to be unfounded in the courts. The 2022 election, by all accounts, was was a was a free a free and fair election. May, may, um, maybe it, it simply reflected the fact that the Republicans were able to gain control of the House of Representatives, even though they did less well than than, than, than they expected. And the elections are run by basically diligent and fair-minded bureaucrats in states edited by democratic governors of the process is, is, is excellent. The problem is, is, right. is having a candidate who is a sore loser. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Robert Shapiro there joining us this morning here on NDTV World. Now, in other news, while Washington Post and the LA Times have refused to endorse any candidate in the election, Puerto Rican newspaper El Nuevo Dia endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris following outrage after a speaker at former President Donald Trump's New York rally, as we said earlier, made offensive comments aimed at Puerto Rico on a Sunday. The endorsement comes as both the Trump and Harris campaigns have been vying for the Puerto Rican vote, especially in battleground state Pennsylvania, where about there are about 500,000 Puerto Rican voters or Puerto Ricans actually live, one would say. And finally, the skeletons are on balconies and the goblins are all up and about, and the U.S. is all set for Halloween, which is celebrated on October 31st each year. Tomorrow, it's a fun festival of ghostly decorations and people partying in all kinds of costumes. But given the elections are just days away, what's really spooking Americans this Halloween? I asked a few Halloween partygoers what they think. The only thing that really politically spooks me this Halloween is inflation. I don't want nothing going up anymore. Thank you. Raising taxes. I don't want to pay no more taxes. The thought of a second Trump presidency, obviously. <laughs> no right to not get an abortion. That's what spooks me. Uh, Donald Trump is very scary in his absolute love of Vladimir Putin. Uh, his rallies are pretty scary as well. I mean, there's nothing spookier than the Trump administration. Okay, what are you dressed up as? Uh, I'm actually from outer space. I'm a space traveler. The fact that women's bodies are up for debate and what women do with their bodies, like, that that's so crazy to me and it's so spooky because it's almost like a dystopian. Trump administration. Anti-immigration, anti anti-abortion, yes. I'm pro-life. Exactly. So I am an immigration attorney, and I know that Trumping winning the election is going to be so spooky for us immigration practitioners. Because, like, I remember last time, he just, like, it was every day, it was a new thing. Like, he changed the law every day, and it was, like, chaotic. So that's what spooks me. And what are you dressed up as? I'm Minion. And you? <laughs> I'm Fiona, and this is my Shrek. No right to not get an abortion. That's what spooks me. I don't love how even Trump or Kamala Harris is um, 
speaking super, super neutral, not really speaking about what they believe in, just so they can win uh, one or the other side. And um, what are we dressed as? Just a horse, a little cowboy. This is my horse, Chata. End up choosing a leader that we believe in, and they don't end up executing on their promises. That spooks me. Undelivered promises. Choosing what you think is right, but ends up not being the right decision for everybody else. Don't be selfish. Being selfish spooks me. Defunding education and also the lack of concern over Gaza. The war in Gaza going on right now in the U.S sort of support for it is also really troubling. Uh, as a voter, it kind of sucks being between a rock and a hard place because neither candidate is ideal when you think about uh, Palestinian issues and solidarity with Palestinian people. Who are we and who are we dressed as? Just a princess on a unicorn. So there you have it, lots haunting voters this Halloween. One caveat though, we spoke to people here in Washington, D.C., which tends to lean heavily Democrats. For NTTV World, Alistair D'Souza, Washington, D.C. That's it for U.S. Election Watch. And before we go, happy Halloween to everyone. And here's also wishing all our viewers a happy Diwali. I'm Alistair D'Souza in Washington, D.C.